This morning we are going to begin a new series talking about the supporting cast and the idea is to look at how people responded to that first advent. Advent, as you probably know, means the coming or the arrival. And so during the season of Advent, we do two things, two things at once. We, we celebrate that first Advent, but we also anticipate the next Advent, and we prepare ourselves for that. And we are going to begin this morning by preparing ourselves from Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to ask Deanna Garcia if she'll read that for us. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the, a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to, now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Deanna. As we come to God's word together, let's prepare our hearts by the ministry of prayer. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, as always, we do pray for the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts that they would be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, I heard a story on NPR that was about uh, some tornadoes that had struck the south. And there was a church in Alabama, and the kids were in church that day because it was a time for children's choir practice. So the church was full of kids. And the pastor went to the door in, in this church, and he opened it up, and he saw a tornado coming straight for the church. So he gathered all of the children and they went into the hallway and there he had them sing. Jesus loves the little children. I'm not going to sing it for you, but Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, green and white. <laughs> they are precious in his sight. Well, he had them singing that something like that in order to calm them down. My singing would not calm you down, but <laughs> theirs did. And, and, and the amazing thing happened is that that tornado was a direct hit on that church. It leveled the church, except for the hallway. And not one child, not only did none lose their life, but none were hurt. And it was an amazing outcome, and, and they couldn't figure it out. Except one little girl said, I know why. Because angels were holding up with a hallway. And when the wind got to be too powerful, they said, we need more help. And more angels came down and held up the hallway. Now, my question for you is, do you believe that little girl? Do you believe that she saw what she saw? Like I said, most Americans do believe in angels. Gallup says that 78% of us believe in angels. And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning, is your belief in angels. During this series called The Supporting Cast, what I'm endeavoring to do is we're going to look at how some of the more minor characters in the Christmas narratives, how they responded to that first advent how they responded to the birth of the Christ child then. And maybe we can learn some lessons about how we should prepare for his coming again. But here's a problem as we begin this series, and that is this. 
the angels don't react. They cause reactions, but they themselves do not have a response. They create a response. In fact, if you look in the the Christmas narratives, the Christmas story, every time an angel appears, the first words out of the angel's mouth is this, do not fear. Apparently, it's a pretty fearful thing to see an angel come, and because he has to calm them down every time. Don't be afraid, because the response that they have is one of fear. But that's not what the angel's doing. That's not the angel's response. But maybe they have a message for those they're talking to. And that's the message that I want us to hear this morning. Now, angels have always been very, very popular. Very, very. They're so cute. And, you know, we have this image of them being very cherubic and just just sweet little creatures. And, And so we put them on our Christmas cards. And we put them on top of our tree even at the risk of our lives, we go up there and we put those angels up there. And at, at my very first church in Philadelphia, the clerk of session of that church collected angels, you know, the little figurines and, and little ceramic things. And she had thousands and thousands of angels. And I'm willing to bet that there are some people, maybe more than one, who collects angels in this church as well. Why? Because we absolutely love Angels, we love them. They're a part of our culture. And and part of our culture also talks about, as Lori did this morning with the kids, our guardian angel. Do you believe that you have a guardian angel? If you do, where did you get that idea? I'm I'm guessing that, that more likely than not, our idea, and by the way, that Gallup poll said that 49% of us believe that we each have a guardian angel. But I think we got that idea more from the movie It's a Wonderful Life than we do from Scripture. You remember the wonder, It's a Wonderful Life and, and the angel Clarence and, and the bell rings and he gets his wings. You remember that? I think that has done far more to inform our understanding of angels than scripture has, than the Bible has. Where do we get the idea that we have a guardian angel? Well, there is one verse that may lend itself to that belief. And if you would, turn with me to Matthew in the 18th chapter. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, you'll find this on page 20 of the New Testament. Matthew in the 18th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 10. Now, a little context here. Jesus is, is speaking about the children, and he's giving a warning about how we respond to the children. And then in verse 10, we read this. Take care that you do not, not, do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven, their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. Their angels. Now, some believe that maybe that possessive pronoun there implies that we all have this angel that protects us. I would suggest to you this morning, that's reading an awful lot into this text. And when we read a lot into the text, what we end up doing eventually is we start to speculate about what angels do and what they're like. And there's a lot of theory about angels. Here's the problem with that, though. When you start to speculate about angel, your attention moves away from God and on to the angels. Do you notice what Jesus says in verse 10? It says that their face is continually before the Lord. They're always looking at God. They are not giving in to distraction and looking elsewhere. They are constantly focused on God. And there is something in that for us. We should always have, like the angels, our attention focused on God. But that's not what our culture's done. 
our culture has become so enamored with angels, we start to make up stuff. And some of it is pretty wacky. There's a woman named Sophie Burnham. And Sophie is an avowed non-Christian. And the reason she's an avowed non-Christian is because her image of God is not very good. But she loves angels. In fact, she wrote a book called A Book of Angels. And the reason she wrote the book is that she believes people are so in love with the angels that they need to know more. The reason they're attracted, according to Sophie, and I'm going to read a sentence from her, she says, we have created this concept of God as punitive, jealous, and judgmental, and angels never are. They are utterly compassionate, which makes me wonder if Sophie has ever read the Bible. Because God is not judgmental and mean. God is compassionate. God showers upon us grace and mercy that flows out of his love. And that's the description that we have of God in Scripture. Angels, on the other hand, are something else altogether. So where does she get this idea that angels are completely and totally compassionate? Not from the Bible. She made it up. She made it up. And see, that's the thing in our culture is when it comes to angels, we can make stuff up and call it spiritual. Now, if you want proof of that, you need to go to Barnes & Noble. <laughs> if you go into Barnes & Noble and you go into the religion section, this is always a good fun thing to do, go into the religion section and look at the number of books about angels. There are reams and reams of angel stuff, and I want to tell you, it is whacked out nonsense. <laughs> Give you a couple examples. There's a guy named John Randolph Price, and he wrote a book called The Angels Within Us, a spiritual guide to 22 angels that govern our lives. See, what he believes is that within our individualized energy field, we have 22 angels that do all of these things for us that make it possible for us to realize our potential within our energy field because of these angels. Where did he get this idea? He made it up. <laughs> maybe, maybe you've heard of Carlos Santana. Very famous uh, guitarist, rock and roll guitarist, very famous for his amazing ability on the guitar. Well, I think Santana probably read one of these books because Santana believes that he has his own personal angel, an inspirational angel. He is even, according to Rolling Stone magazine, has even named this angel Metatron. So what Santana does when he's stuck and he's creatively not, the juices aren't flowing, well, he'll light a candle and he'll chant until Metatron shows up. And then Metatron will show him the way. Now, where did Santana get this idea about Metatron? He made it up. See, I think that for us Christians, what we should be doing when it comes to the subject of angels, even, even the angels that are so popular in our culture, is that we ought to read Scripture and discover what Scripture has to say. And amazingly enough, Scripture has a lot to say about angels. In fact, I think there's something like 300 appearances of angels in the Scriptures from beginning to end. In Job chapter 38, we are told that angels were present when God created the heavens and the earth. So at creation, at the very beginning, angels are present. In the book of Revelation, when history comes to an end and, and the ending is there, angels will be present, we are told, in the book of Revelation. So from beginning to end, we have angels throughout Scripture. They are common. And, and I really think there's really not any reason to doubt the existence of angels. But there's the problem. Is that some of us really struggle with this whole notion of angels. Why? Because we've never seen one. 
Unlike that little girl in Alabama, we have never seen an angel, and therefore we wonder, do they really exist? Can I believe in a creature I have never seen? What's really interesting about that is that scientists are constantly discovering new creatures that we have never seen. Not long ago, on, on the island of Borneo, Borneo they discovered a, a little mammal that looks something like a cat or a fox. We have never seen that animal before. A couple of years ago, a Japanese scientist discovered a whole new species of whales that humankind has never seen before. In fact, scientists tell us that of all of the creatures and the plants on the face of the globe, 70% of them have probably never been seen by human beings. But I believe they exist. I also believe that angels exist. And I don't have a problem believing that angels exist, but here's the issue. What do they do? What do they do? Well, to help answer that question, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, the first part of this chapter, talks a lot about angels, and and, and a couple of things that it suggests is that one is that angels are created beings, and, and that they are lower than God. In fact, angels are created even lower than humanity because we, you and I, are created in the image of God. Angels are not But what do they do? Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Are not all angels spirits in the divine service, sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? All angels are in divine service, which is another way of saying that all angels serve God. That is, ultimately, their primary function, is that they serve God. But then they are sent here. And, And when they come here, according to that verse, they come to serve us. So in serving us, they are serving God. So what does that service look like? Well, you know, again, we're told that they were there at creation. They're gonna help bring time to an end. But we're also told that they protect which helps us with that notion of a guardian angel in in the Old Testament. Angels protect Lot. You remember when Daniel was in the lion's den? Who protected Daniel in the lion's den? Angels did. So one of their roles is to protect. Another is to lead. Angels lead the Israelites through the wilderness. Angels lead the Israelites into battle. So they also lead the people of God. But here's the real deal. Here's what angels do over and over and over again is they communicate. They are messengers. This is their primary role, to be a messenger. In fact, the the word for angel in Hebrew means messenger, malach. And the word in Greek for angel means messenger. This is their primary function. This is what they do. And during this time of year, and when we read the Christmas stories again and again, what we discover is that's exactly what they do. The role of angels in these Christmas narratives is they come as messengers. They come bringing a message for and from God. For example, We know that angels come to Zechariah and announce the birth of his son, John the Baptist. Angels come to Joseph multitudes of times, and and they come to to Mary and announces the birth of the son. And in the passage that uh, we read this morning, the angels come and announce to the shepherds that this is about to take place. To you this day is born in the city of David the child. The child the one who is going to save you from your sins, the one who is going to give you hope in a hopeless world, the one who's going to come and give meaning, the one you've been waiting for, he's coming. He's coming, and this is what God wants you to know. But when the angel makes that announcement, what what does he first have to say? Don't be afraid. 
Apparently, it was a very spectacular scene at night in the hills, and they're lit up, and then there's a host of angels that come, and they sing, and that would have struck fear in anybody's heart. You know, I believe that if angels came down and visited us right now in the sanctuary, we would have a similar response. Our foreheads would be on the ground and we would be chewing on carpet because we would be afraid. <laughs> and the angel would say to us, just like he said to the first one, don't be afraid. Now, why is it the angel says, don't be afraid? I think it's this. Don't miss the message. See, I've come here to tell you something, and if you are afraid, you're going to th dwell on the fear, and you're going to think about that, and you're going to miss the word that I have for you. Don't be afraid. Listen up. I've got something to tell you. An angel would be horrified to think that they would miss that because they're so enamored with the angel. I'll show you one last passage if I can. Book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, go to the second, almost the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 19. And we're going to look at a couple of verses here. It, again, context is important. The, John is on the island of Patmos, and he's having this vision about, the, about all kinds of things. And one of the things he's having a vision is about a conversation that he has with an angel. So in verses 9 and 10, it goes like this. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you, do you see what's going on here? In John's vision, he's having a conversation with an angel. And he's so awestruck by that, he bends down to worship the angel. And the angel says, don't do that. For you and I, we are both servants of God. Worship him. Worship him. Don't worship angels. It's not about them. It's about him. See, I have this vision that in our country, there's a lot of folks who are so enamored with angels, that are so caught up in creating all of this stuff, and the angel wants to say to all of them, no, 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 it's him. It's not us. Don't be distracted by us and miss the message of the season. That to you this day in the city of David is born a savior. Your savior is not an angel. The one who's going to bring hope to your life is not angels. No, 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 it's him. See, that's a good message for us. We may not be distracted by angels, but there's a lot of distractions this time of year. You know, we think about all of the, the, the festivities and all of the parties and all of the events and decorating our house, and we get sort of caught up in that, and an angel says, no, 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 it's him. We start thinking about the gifts, the, the stuff that we're going to get and the stuff that we want to give, and we think about the tree and everything that's supposed to go under that, and an angel says, no, 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 it's him. We think about the, the, the family that's coming and, and, and coming with joy or desperation or whatever it is in your family. But we're not really sure we're looking forward to that or not. There's a lot of mm, angst. But we get caught up in it. It becomes a big distraction this time of year. And the angel says, no, 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 no. It's him. For some of us, the big distraction this time of year isn't the good things, it's the bad things. It's, it's, it's the anxiety and the nervousness that always comes. Maybe it's the depression because we are alone. Maybe it's the loneliness. Maybe it is the fear that often comes to us during the season of Advent. And we focus on that. 
And the angel comes and says, no, 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 no. It's him. It's him. An angel is a messenger, and that is the message that he has for you this morning. It's him. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time of year. We thank you for all that it represents, not just the spirit of giving, but it's this time of year that we are reminded that you have visited this earth once in the form of that Christ child. We are reminded that you have come here to save us from ourselves, from our sin, that we have hope because of that first arrival. Father God, as we prepare during the season of Advent and we prepare for your coming again, we pray that you would work in our hearts. There are so many trappings. There are so many distractions. Lord, that this time of year, you would focus our hearts and our minds on you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.